Welcome back, fellow scrubs. It's a special day today. Uh, we got a new a new project that I'm unveiling. So uh, I'm very excited to share this. I've been thinking about it for a while to uh, add this kind of thing to the program. And um, so I guess we'll just kind of just dive right into it. I'll let you know like what's the basic idea, what's it about, what's it gonna hopefully look like. And it's hard to determine because this is literally day one, like strict day one. I haven't touched Unity. I haven't done any prototyping. It's, you're going to see it from start to finish. And uh, so let me bring it around. So as you might have seen, if you saw the post about the uh, thing, this is some of the pixel art that might be going into it, uh, and I'll show you a better version of that that's not skewed and, and all fancy. So as you can probably already tell, it's going to be an NES-like platforming kind of game. Uh, so here is another like mock screen, and we'll, we'll go over those too. Um, so I guess the basic idea of the game is it's it's an NES style platformer. I'm just gonna use NES style graphics. Um, now obviously, it's not an actual NES game. So we're gonna be building it in Unity. It's gonna play on the PC, uh, that kind of stuff. But it'll try to. I don't want to use the word emulate, uh, but it will try to live up to the NES aesthetic. Um, I mean, obviously Unity is not, you know, going to program the game like the NES. It doesn't have the same uh, features and, and stuff as the NES did. Like, the inner workings are completely different. Um, and we'll try to emulate the, the, the look of the NES game as, as much as possible. Um, but I'm not going to bend the game to, to those limits, necessarily. If I, if I think we should have a creative break somewhere, then I might do something like that. But I do obviously, you know, there's the basic reason to, to, to do it this way at all, of course, is to invoke that, you know, old game look, the old nostalgia kind of uh, feel to it. And I'll try to live up to that as much as possible. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea of, of, of what the limitations of the, the NES were, so I can hopefully keep myself grounded in that. Um, in, in uh, uh, how to say, keep myself on track and, and on the rails and, and not be doing something that's like, oh, that's obviously not something the NES could have done, um, you know, and then we'll go from there. At least that's how I, I feel about it right now, and uh, so we'll see. Uh, the graphic style, I just whipped up some what they call programmer graphics. <laughs> They're not very good, but they get the point across at least enough to uh, convey the idea to make a mock-up. You know, you'll have a health bar, you'll have items, and that kind of stuff. So, okay. So it's an NES platformer, you know. It's... They get a dime a dozen, so what makes this one different, I guess you would say. Um, so the idea that I have going forward is essentially... Um, it's more of an exploration type of game. So if you think something like Simon's Quest... Um, <clears throat> something in that vein, you know, taking taking some of the more modern, like, Metroidvania aspects, thinking about those and incorporating them back, you know, into into an older title like this. So that would be, I guess, the, the primary way to think of it, maybe the easiest way to, to think of it when, when you're trying to figure out, you know, what exactly is this. Um, and so there's, like, lots of games, well, I wouldn't say lots of games that have done it, but there have been exploration games, like Simon's Quest, obviously. You know, games with, with essentially non-linear progression. So like Mario Brothers, you know, you're going A to Z, you go through one level and you can't go back. That kind of stuff. Um, even Mario 3 gates you out of levels that you've already gone to. Uh, which was interesting because they had a map, and I always thought that maybe there was a way to, to go back or whatever. Maybe there... I don't know, I don't think there is. I don't remember being able to do that. Uh, but either way, so this would this would truly be like 
I guess you would say, the non-linear progression uh, to a degree. Obviously, you know, like like classic Metroidvanias, you you know, you're gonna have starting areas, and you're gonna have places you can't get to yet until later, until you get you know different items and stuff. Uh, so then now I have to introduce what the setting is because it'll it'll sort of make more sense in that regard, and then I can reference other games that that might help illustrate the idea. Um, so the basic idea here for the setting and the characters and all that um, is that a couple kids end up finding like a mansion in the woods and they're like oh that's cool let's go check it out and um, so the current concept I, I drew a bunch of characters here just to, con to conceptualize them but um, the current idea is that there are three three kids and so you, you go there with, uh, you start with the th three kids, you know, like a cutscene, I guess, wise. And then once you hit the premises of the mansion, maybe you step inside or, or whatever, um, one of the kids gets kidnapped. They're gone. And so at that point, it's like, oh crap, we gotta go get our friend. And so the remaining two kids will split up. And then you control one, and the other one goes on this way. And so the idea is you have to search through the mansion, you know, you gotta find keys to unlock doors to other rooms, get new abilities to reach new places, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, um, that way you can progress through the mansion and find your friend and get the heck out. And that's essentially the idea. Uh, so, now that we have a basic understanding of what's going on, and kind of explain that, um, the core, the core way that you explore the mansion. So again, these are these are just per little mock-ups I've made. I don't think that I'm gonna go with this kind of HUD style. I'll be completely honest. I like this one's my favorite so far, the way that the HUD works, because this keeps the game in almost like a four to three ratio, and um, then you can just fill out the sides, and this keeps the whole game like in the in our current world of of all widescreen. Um, it keeps, you know, the general feel of the game in the middle, but you've got your HUDs on the side, and so there's nothing really obscuring, which is really nice. So it's kind of like the the uh, the vertical rotation, or never or the the rotation, I should say, of this kind of aspect. I felt that this was like too it was too wide, like you couldn't see too much top or bottom. I thought about making like the resolution smaller, but I didn't like this either. This actually looks more like when they put the NES games on the Game Boy Advance and the screen wasn't quite big enough. That's what I got the feeling off of this. So even with the HUD half size, you know, that didn't, that didn't really work out. So I tried a bunch of things. Um, like this is one of the other ones, but it just looks so wide. It doesn't, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't look that retroness. Yeah, yeah, um, essentially, yeah, Dallas did that, didn't they? Yeah, they kept it. Yeah, in the middle. I forget what they what exactly they had on their um, HUD, but uh, yeah, I suppose it is like that. Yeah. And uh, hello, AJ. <laughs> so the you've got the you're only going to control one kid. I know it shows two here, but that's just so I could test the what they look like on the on the background because they're different color outlines. Um, oh yeah, you might notice. This is a little thing. I, I started with flat sprite characters, um, but I quickly became very apparent that if you're going to do flat sprite characters, you have to limit yourself to a specific set of colors that you are not allowed to use in the background. And I think that's why a lot of the old NES games just have like a black background because they the characters don't. Either a black background or a, or a single solid thing. Like Mario 1 has just the sky, and they know not to use any blue shades that are close enough to the sky that you can't see it. Double kid mode for stretch goal. <laughs> well, yeah, I, like I said, I'm not 100% settled on, on, on the, the structure <clears throat> and how that would work, whether or not you would control two. Uh, you know, whether or not you could use both of the characters or not. Um, a lot of things... I guess I should preface it with this. All the stuff that we're talking about today, and this happens a lot in game design, all of it tomorrow could change. 
Um, yeah, MC Kids. Well, and that was kind of the idea that I was thinking of, that it might be possible to choose between which character that remains. Um, like, one of them gets kidnapped and you get to choose between the other two. And it could be just a cosmetic thing. Um, definitely. You'd just be like, oh, I want to be that character, I want to be that character. Maybe you choose them at the beginning, and then it randomizes which one of the remaining two get kidnapped, and then the other one goes off, and then you're left with the one that you chose up front. You could definitely do that. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily change the game. You could just swap out the graphics and, and be like, you know, here you go, so we'll just use different ones. You could definitely do something like that. And you have to take narrative into consideration whether or not the characters talk. You know, dialogue might have to change depending on, say, if you choose the girl or the, or the guy. They might be referred to, you know, differently. So um, that's something definitely to think about. I think it'd be it would be a great thing to explore to to see how that would work. Um, but like I was saying, like all this could change. Like this is this day one. It's literally just day one. Um, and, and oftentimes a lot of things do change along the way. So you're gonna kinda get like behind the scenes all access pass <laughs> to get a get a look at how games are made and how oh god, how how sloppy it, it looks like when you actually view it from the back end. <laughs> like well, a lot of people have no idea, like this stuff just like nope, that doesn't work, just throw it out like an entire feature. Like, nope, just toss it. We don't it doesn't work, you know, when you start prototyping stuff. Or halfway, you're like, oh crap, I got this great idea for this mechanic. Alright, we're gonna rework the entire game now <laughs> to fit this mechanic. Um, and I, I think one of the good examples, we were actually just talking about this in the Discord server. Um, like, I, I believe it was Splatoon didn't have the ink mechanic. Like, it wasn't ink that they were using. Like, they they went, they, they sought out to make, like, a, a kiddie shooter game. But they didn't come up with the ink idea until like halfway through. And then they're like, oh, well now now that's perfect. Like everything makes sense. This is the answer we're looking for. And then everything revolved around that. And that it happens a lot more than you might think. Uh, some projects just go in, this is the idea we got, and they bang it one, two, three, and they're, they're done. But a lot of times things evolve and change. And, you know, you could get part way into it and be like, you know, there's something missing. There's, there's just there's something's not quite right. And then you come up with something to, to put in there and make it better. That's typically how that goes. Uh, or you'll figure out, oh, that idea that we had, um, that cost way too much to do. We can't do that. <laughs> or, or say the, the hardware can't, can't sustain that, uh, that level of stuff. And that was more prominent back, you know, like the older console days. It's like, yeah, we would love to make a 3D game, but the NES can't do it, so... Okay, you know what? Actually, I take that back. You can, you can sort of, kind of fake render 3D on the NES, but it, it's horribly slow. It's horribly slow. I think there were a couple games that actually did it. It was like a tank game that used vector graphics or something, and and they must have wrote their own routine for it or something. But I guess they drew the lines and whatever. Um, but you know, you couldn't you couldn't get a game like Zone of the Unders, if anybody remembers that. We were just talking about that too in Discord, that's how I remember it. The Zone of the Unders was a PS2 launch title. And um You know, you can't do that on the NES. So there's there's obviously, you know, limitations based on that. And that's where a lot of projects when they first start out it's what we call a prototyping. You make a prototype and you try out the idea and see, you know, is it gonna work? We're gonna, we're gonna implement it, you know, with placeholder graphics and all that, and then put it together. And hey, if it works, cool. That's great. Um, but if it doesn't work, then you gotta change your plans and that kind of stuff. So, uh, I don't expect too many road bumps here, but we might run into something like that, where it's like, nah, you know what, that doesn't work. Or we tried it out, and eh, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, no, that don't feel good. That doesn't, I don't like it. So, we'll change it, you know, something like that. So just kind of prefacing everything with that going forward. So like six months down the line, but yeah, what, what, what happened to the saw? I thought we were gonna put a saw in the game. <laughs> and be like, ah, the plans change. It just happens. Um, the saw is just, I don't know. I just drew the saw. I had the idea that maybe somewhere on the mansion premises there's a, a bush or a tree or something. You gotta cut it down. So you get the saw, and then you, you go to the tree and cut it down. Something like that. 
Um, there's actually, it's actually, um, there's a reason that I, uh, that I have that idea. Um, and this is one of the, one of the other games I was going to say that uh, were like that. Like, My Land Secret Castle was somewhat non-linear. Um, you could go into stages and find items to, you know, get to new places or to get, like, power-ups and stuff. And... And that was that was one of the inspirations for this, and I really liked My Line Secret Castle. It was the execution uh, of their development of that game was was pretty terrible. Um, there, there were a lot of problems with that game, but I think that the the core idea was actually really nice, um, and so I like to incorporate that kind of stuff. So My Line Secret Castle had a saw in it, and I always used to think um, I might actually I might have the I downloaded a bunch of maps here. To use as reference for the for the starting graphics, and they kind of get an idea of what I what I liked and didn't like in the graphics. Let's see, do I have? I have it. Uh, oh, I don't have the outside. Huh? It's kind of chopped up here. Hmm. All right. Well. I guess I'll just explain it. I don't I don't see an actual outside map. So in the castle map, so you have the well here, you can actually go down the well. But um like right here, there is a tree. And the tree wouldn't let you go by. So it was like roughly like right here. And you couldn't get by the tree. But I found a saw item eventually in the game. And I'm like, oh, you should be able to chop down the tree. And go jump in the well, right? No, that's not what you're supposed to do. Apparently, you're supposed to use the saw to cut out the iron bars or something. Which didn't make sense to me at all. And I'm like, oh yeah, saw. You can take down trees with saws. And so that that's why I drew the saws, just so I was thinking about that as I was coming up with a couple little items to put on the HUD. Um, <laughs> in, in to this day, every like I played it and I forgot about it too. I, like I found out what you need to do with the saw, but every time I get it, I'm like, oh yeah, I can go chop that tree down now, right? No, I can't. I can keep reminding myself can't chop the tree down. So that's I don't know. I guess a little inside joke for that. Um, I don't know what happened. If I cut, maybe I cut this out. I'm not sure why this map's all jimmied up. I'm surprised I don't have a, a full one here, but well, either way. Um, Getting off track. So here, I guess uh, to kind of keep it moving along, um, throw my line secret castle in the well. Oh no! <laughs> oh. It doesn't deserve that. Shut up. It had a lot of promise. It just kind of sucked <laughs> when they actually put it together. But I think a lot of the concepts could be done okay. Um. <laughs> Poor My Land Secret Castle. I know, everybody shits on that game. Oh, I had a tree here! You know why? It's funny, because I was thinking about that friggin' tree. This, I was thinking about the tree when I was drawing the saw, so I drew the tree after it. Here. I should've just did that. There you go, there's the tree. <laughs> it looks kind of like that in My Land, too. It's funny. Uh, So yeah, the, I guess the keep moving along the design idea here. Um, you you'll be able to enter the mansion, and you'll be able to go into the courtyard and then come you know in and out a little bit. Um, if you think of like in Symphony of the Night or Harmony of Dissonance when you enter the castle in those games, like you can go back out into the courtyard, something like that. But once you're inside, you're presented with doors. Uh, what other terrible <laughs> NES games will you be referencing? <laughs> well, depending on how you feel about it, I guess Simon's Quest to a degree. Um, some people really hate that game. <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde, or Jekyll and Hyde? Or, I thought you were going to say Hyde White, Back to the Future. <laughs> I only picked my one because I think that the, the basic idea has a... has a good... core to it. They just screwed up the execution. Uh, so, and, and you know, Simon's Quest to a degree, you, you could argue the same thing. 
Um, a lot of the, a lot of those games seem to have fallen into the trap of, you know, we have to make it too cryptic, we have to make it too hard to figure out where to go. You know, instead of like, you know, you compare compare Symphony of the Night to Simon's Quest. Simon's Quest is a Nintendo Power game. You have to have Nintendo Power to finish it. Because if you don't, you don't know what to do. Like, it's it's so cryptic. It's like, okay, grab the red crystal and stand in this spot and kneel for, like, ten seconds. Nobody tells you to do that in the game, so how are you supposed to figure it out? You don't. And my line was the same way. There were so many cryptic, like, crappy secrets in there that's like... You never figure it out. You have to. You just literally have to get Nintendo Power to finish it, and and I think that's where those games went awry. So you say, okay, the Simon's Quest is the progenitor of Symphony of Night, and Symphony of Night was super good. And you can take that core element, that exploration, you know, the, the getting new weapons, fighting enemies, and leveling up, and just fix what's wrong with it, and then now all of a sudden you've got a great game, you know. So that that's kind of the. This was the idea of, of, of bringing up my hunt. <laughs> and I don't I don't think there's there's anything wrong with that. I think there's, there's a lot of games out there that are like, you know, the core idea was good, it was just marred by other issues. And I think about that a lot actually. You know, when I when I play a game that's not really great and that's not up to snuff, I think, you know, how can we fix this? How can we do that? And I think some of the elements of this uh, gameplay has uh, rose from that sort of pondering. Are there any maniacs in the mansion? I knew someone was going to bring that up. No, the, the game will not uh, be point and click. Just to, <laughs> just to uh, nip that one in the bud. No, it'll be it'll be a platformer. You know, like your Kirby's, your Mario's, your Mega Man's, that kind of stuff. Um, and well, yeah, like my line was a platformer as well. So the, the core game loop, I guess if you want to call it, um, when you enter the mansion, there's going to be doors, and there's going to be the separate floors, so you have floor one, floor two, you know, maybe like a basement, you know, that kind of stuff, but they've got doors in them, so when you enter a door, you enter a room, you know, within a floor, and that's where the, the floor HUD thing here comes into play, so floor one, one would be floor one, room one, one, two would be floor one, room two. That kind of thing. So, you know, this would be room one, this would be room two. Uh, so you have to kick the hamster into the microwave? <laughs> no! <laughs> no! Oh, uh, terrible. So, basically what will happen when you enter a door, you enter, uh, basically, every room is like a stage, you could think of it that way. Um, so when you enter the door, you go to the you go to the stage, and so your hallway is sort of your hub world in that way. And some doors may be locked, or or some doors, um, or you you might not be able to get to the second floor right away, or you might need a like, key to the basement, you know, something like that. So you you'll be gated in progression, but as you find these items, the keys, and the, the power ups to, to get to new places, you know, things start to open up a little. So once you enter a door, you cannot come back out. Uh, so what I'm thinking of is there could be like a wall monster or a door monster, and they just eat the door, essentially. And so then in the level, um, your your primary goal to get out of the room is to find the wall monster, beat him, and he'll barf up the door. And then you and you get into the door and you'll come back out where you came. But um, so you're thinking, oh, well, how, how does that work? How do you beat the game then? Well, inside each level, uh, you're going to have items that you can get. So let's say that, you know, uh, door number two is locked. You can't go into it. You go into door number one, you can you can beat the level and you can come back out, but if you didn't get the key, then you can't get into door number two. So you can keep going back into the level until you find the key. Once you get the key, now you can go into door number two. And say door number two has, I don't know, double jump power. And, you know, so maybe room three, maybe you can go to room three, but you can't get anywhere in room three. Uh, you can't get the special item because you need to double jump. Well, you need the key from one to go into room two to get the double jump, to go to room three, 
to get the next item, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's kind of like, levels are sort of self-contained in a way, but they're replayable. And as you gain more abilities from other areas, you can come back and go in there and, you know, get other stuff. Um, so that's, that's kind of the core, I guess, game loop, if you want to call it, that, uh, to get through stuff. So you'll collect items, and that some will be power-ups, some might just be, you know, access to different areas, like I said, keys for doors, something like that. I want to avoid keys as much as possible, but I think one... Yeah, eh, you have to have... Come on, you gotta... If you got a mansion, you gotta have something like doors that are locked. It's just, it's just part of the theme. You know, you think of like Resident Evil and having to get keys to unlock doors and stuff. Like, it's just part of it. It's just part of a mansion. And I think that's another good example. You know, Resident Evil, you have one map that you're constantly going through over and over. And then the idea, you know, you, you pick up a key somewhere or you pick up an ability, then that lets you open up a new area. Um, that sort of, like, you know, everything's kind of interlinked and, and, you know, that, that kind of, I don't know. Well, it's a mansion, right? <laughs> In Resident Evil, it's a mansion. And there you go. It's, you know, the same kind of concept. And I think they pulled it off extremely well. So that's definitely one game that I'll be looking at, you know, as the, the actual layout of the mansion will get designed. I think it's a very, very, very good one to think about. Especially for this kind of game. So, um, yeah, and it's pretty much the idea. So... Secret lab under the mansion? Probably. <laughs> I mean, come on. You gotta have you gotta have something in the, in the in the basement, right? You gotta have something creepy in the basement. Basements are always creepy. You know, you get to the basement, that's end game, right? That's how it works. Okay, so the the mansion's haunted, right? Yeah. You probably guessed. I probably mentioned it already. Uh, the mansion's haunted. So it's gonna be kind of like you know, silly horror, make Castlevania kind of stuff. Um, and so I just, as, as an, I, a, a concept, I made, like, a little, little floating zombie head, maybe he follows you around, or something like that. Um, so you will be able to beat enemies. Uh, I'm not 100% settled on the attack method, but the, the first idea that came to me was, what if you had, one of the items that you find is, like, a, a power ring sort of thing, you know? like Captain Planet or something like that. You put on the ring and then, oh, you can shoot fire or whatever. Um, but what, say it's a magic ring and you can shoot like little magic projectiles. So I figure like this might be when you first get it, you can shoot the little ones and maybe later you can shoot the bigger ones. Or maybe there's a range involved. You know, maybe you get an upgrade and, and all of a sudden you can shoot farther. Or you get an upgrade and you have powered up orbs, you know, something like that. So that was the, uh, that was the original idea as far as attacking enemies. But you wouldn't be able to right away. You'd have to find the, the ring. But it would be like, you know, the first door that you go in, it would be, you know, somewhere in there. Because you would have to beat the wall monster to get out, right? So you have to, you have to encounter it. You think about like in Mega Man X, the first one, you go to Chill Penguin Sage, you can't avoid the capsule, you know. You have to get the dash boots in X1 and Chill Penguin stage. So it might end up being something like that. Um, and so then you know you're gonna you're gonna get upgrades like I said and go on and, and do that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't thought too too much about the combat yet. So there's a lot of room that will go around. But um, to be honest. You gotta start with the with the super basics. If um, if running around the mansion, running and jumping and jumping on platforms and stuff, if that don't feel good, then I no no weapon no weapon mechanic in a game is gonna save you. It's just not gonna feel right. So I'm starting basically at square one, and we'll we'll try to get them running around and, and doing that kind of stuff first. Um, and then that gives me a little time to think about the, the weapons. And we can try different stuff. Like, you know, like I said, things can change. We could try it and be like, oh, shooting works really well. Actually, that, that's really cool. That feels good. Or we can say, you know what? Shooting doesn't really work for this game. You know? Or maybe we have to add a secondary weapon or something. You know? It's going to evolve in real time as we go along. So, 
And that's that's exciting. I like that kind of organic feel to to development. Um, so yeah, you might be wondering, all right, well, what about the mouse? <laughs> Is the mouse a bad guy? Is the mouse gonna get you? Will there be a battle royale mode? <laughs> yeah, two player, two player shooting game. You know what's funny? Um, especially speaking of the. Uh, yeah, let's go to YouTube. Especially speaking of like shooting and stuff, because that's very Mega Man esque. A lot of people don't know. Uh, Mega Man Seven has a battle mode in it. it actually, has a two player battle mode. And that's what made me think, like when you said battle royale mode or whatever, it made me think of that. Um, it's actually really interesting. You actually, yeah, you get. The player one is Mega Man and player two is base. And you actually fight. Oh, I guess you can select. Oh, you, you, you could probably have both both Mega Man or both base. And you, it's, it's, it's literally just the Mega Man gameplay, but you get to shoot each other and, you know, and all that. It's like really interesting. It's really, really cool. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of strange, but. You know, so that's not, it's not been, it's not like it hasn't been done before. Um, I think there's Street Fighter moves too. Like, you can do like a Shoryuken and that does like Slash Claw and stuff. They're not really doing them though, but I'm pretty sure there's something that you can do. So that, that's, a lot of people don't know that that's actually in the game. It's legit. You just need the password to get to it. It's pretty funny. I don't think it, I don't think the game actually even tells you about it. It was just a straight up secret. It was just was it was what it was. Man, it, it it makes it even worse because this game was programmed. From what I understand, this game was made in three months or some some crazy slim time like that. I don't know how the hell they had the time to put put stuff like this in. Like who does that? Hey, you're already sleeping at the office and you're like, you know what? We're putting in a battle mode that no one's ever gonna find because we're not gonna give you the password for like years. <laughs> like who does that? The Capcom devs were hardcore back then. Like, not, no joke. Like, they were just... Oh. They were just boss mode the whole way. <laughs> Who has time for that? Oh my god. I can't believe they did that. It's cool, though. It's cool. But, no, I'm not planning anything. Anything like that. But that did, that did remind me of that. Um, so, what, what's the deal with the mouse? You're probably asking. Alright, so... I think that um, in a game like this, you probably should have some sort of like shop that you can visit. And so the mouse plays the role as the shopkeeper. So he's one of the quote-unquote monsters in the mansion. And um, but he's a good monster. He wants you to solve a problem. He wants you to get your friend back and that kind of stuff. So he's basically the shopkeeper. And so maybe he'll give you the ring, I don't know, maybe he'll give you the saw, or sell you the saw, or or sell you like, I don't know, this could be a health item, I just drew it. It's a heart in a jar. You know, it's a health item just by looking at it. Um, so he might give you that kind of stuff, and and uh, I don't know what kind of money there's gonna be. Like I just, on the HUD, I just put money, but I don't know. Maybe you have to collect souls from the monsters, or, or monster parts, I don't know. You know, something like that. But I think, I, I really do think that having a shop kind of mechanic, or, I don't know if that's a mechanic per se, but a shop element in the game, I think makes a lot of sense. I really like the, the idea of having that, you know. Because then you could go to him and maybe he could give you some hints. Uh, you could talk to him, like, if you don't know where to go, maybe he can give you, like, a little hint on uh, what, what you should do next, or what you might be looking for. And so the other thing with this is it opens up the secondary exploration halves, um, or makes you think about them. So the the mouse is a mouse. He lives in the wall because he's a mouse. He's, you go in the mouse hole and it's like, oh shit, it's a shop or something like that. And so here's the deal. What happens if you can go through some certain walls? What happens if uh, you enter door one? And you can find a path through the wall and get into door two. 
you get into room two from room one. Or maybe you can find a secret path in room one to go upstairs and end up on the second floor. Maybe that's how you get on floor number two. So sort of breaking, presenting the mold in one way, but sort of breaking the the preconception of, oh, this is, this is you, you find an item, but you go to a different area to use that item. Uh, it might not be so simple as getting something and getting out of the room and then going to another room. Uh, it could be you go into this room and then you end up in a different part of this room that you couldn't get to by entering normally. And and then you can use your double jump there or something, and then maybe that's how you get upstairs. You know, something like that. So at some point, the, the secrets and the areas in the rooms become sort of uh, interlocked, interconnected. So the, the idea of going into this door but then ending up in this room and beating this room, this wall monster, actually ends you up out on this door. You know, something like that. So it's it's like a puzzle in and of itself between the hub world and the levels that you have to enter. The mouse, the mouse's name is Shoppy, like Mappy. Who's Mappy? I don't know, I, I don't get that reference. Who's Mappy? Shoppy like that? I don't know. I don't get it. What, what game is that referencing? Or... So I think we can we can be. You'll have to you'll have to look up. Matt. Is it safe to look up on stream? Don't lie to me. <laughs> you don't lie to me. <laughs> Any lost level shenanigans sending you back a four? Possibly. There could be something. I mean, if it's not a linear thing either, so like going up to floor number two, you know, isn't necessarily a progression if you have to come back down. Like, so say, say you go into door number one, that takes you to floor two, and then up here you go, you exit this door, go into the next door here, and that's how you get back down here. So it's not, a, it's not a linear thing, Matthew. Uh, all right, all right, all right. I'm putting it off screen. <laughs> I'm gonna Google it off screen. Mappy. Oh! Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I get you. Okay, I remember now. Yeah, it's an old ass game. Mappy. Mappy the mouse. Shoppy. <laughs> I call him Shoppy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember this game. I don't think I played it, but I've seen it. I've seen it before. What the heck is this? I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know what that is. Look at him. That's funny. <laughs> okay, Mappy Land. There's a Mappy Land. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually played any of them. But I've, uh, I've seen, I've seen it, and I know it exists. But, yeah, it's funny. Mouse Cop. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, whether or not you get sent back to a floor may not be, you may not be, um, it might not be the wrong way to go. So in, in this way we can construct a maze through the mansion, you know, of places to go. So combining, you know, the hub world, uh, to level kind of dichotomy there along with like Metroidvania elements. And that kind of stuff, and I think that will be that will create an interesting environment. You'll have to think about it in different ways, in ways that you wouldn't normally think about. Um, you know, the game in like in a Metroidvania, because you don't have that extra layer of the hallway, you know, outside. So the hub world becomes part of the maze. It's not just a level select. You know, it, it, you actually have to think about you know where you're going and where you need to go, and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, maybe going going up to the here, going down here, maybe you get something in here that takes you to the basement. You get the basement key. Um, at some point, you're going to have to be able to unlock, you know, an easy way to get from 4-1 to 4-2. Like, say that the, the stair, there's a stairway, and then, I don't know, there's a door on the stairway, and you can't go up the stairway or something. 
or maybe you get up the stairs and then on floor number two there's you're immediately blocked off by something could be anything um, but you'll you'll eventually have to clear out those paths to give I know fast travel I guess would be an, a good way to explain it so that you can quickly go from 401 to 42 without having to go through here through the secret passage to get up but maybe the first time you have to do that and then you can unlock the door over here so that lets you go up you know from the hallway areas and that kind of stuff but um I don't I don't think it would be bad to necessarily have traps that do send you back down um, but you should probably reward those in some way so kind of like the return paths in some of the metroidvanias you know oh we we didn't really progress because we went back to the starting area but there was a, an item along the way that helped you do that you know helped you out you got a new sword or whatever but kind of, Cynthia and I and Harmony Distance do those pretty well they've always had uh, really good rewards for for heading back up toward the, the starting point so things like that I think that, that that's really the that maze like aspect I think will will work out well as long as it's executed and planned for properly I think that will sort of like that's it's it's not something you typically see it adds like an additional layer on top of the, the traditional metroidvania elements so I think it will actually work out really well uh, as long as it's executed properly. Um, so as far as the other thing I wanted to mention, um, I would like a little bit of outside area stuff. And, you know, and, and again, this is borrowing from my line, but I think it's a really good idea, the fact that you're like, oh yeah, okay, so we're getting into the castle, but you might not think, hey, jump in the well. And that's a new stage. So we could have stuff like that too, where it's like, you know, you wouldn't normally think, you think, oh, I'm supposed to progress in the mansion, but no, you gotta go out and jump in the well to get the key to get downstairs or something, you know, something like that. Um, or maybe there's like a gated garden area, and then you need the key to get through the gate and get in there, and maybe there's a maze, garden maze level, and you know, stuff like that. I don't think there should be too much stuff on the outside, but um, just something that you can imagine would be on the grounds of the mansion, outside, of, or inside the forest that surrounds the, the property. So I'm thinking like a well and a garden, that might that might be like it, you know? Maybe the garden's got an underground passage to get back into the, the mansion and get into a new room. I don't think too much focus should be on the outside, but I think one or two elements out there should be fine. They kind of mix up things. And, Give it a little bit of an aesthetical break here and there. This is Giant Land, right? Yeah, Big Island. <laughs> I love Giant Land from Mario 3. That was that was so good. <laughs> the fact that you could go that one well, level where you go in the door and it's the giant version of the enemies, and then you go through the doors, all the small ones, so you had to keep going back and forth. That was fun. So that that's pretty much it. That's the idea. Uh, I think I think that encapsulates the core idea very well. Um, and then you know it'll evolve from there. We might find that hey, one of these ideas doesn't work out too well, or hey, we want to add something to it. That's cool. You know that kind of stuff. That's that's pretty much it. If anybody's got any further questions about the design? And I can get into the graphical side of it. That pretty much sums up most of what I've been thinking so far. So, um, as far as item use goes, some of them could be passive items. Um, like this one's obviously an active item, you get this one. You get the ring and you can shoot stuff. Uh, I don't know if you'd have to equip it. It might be your only weapon, so it just, you know, it just there shows up on the, on the item list. Like the saw is something that you would get, but you just can't use. 
unless you're near the tree, it just automatically causes the thing to happen. Not sure I want... I don't know. It might be unavoidable to have a screen where you have to select the item and then try to use it. Um, depending on how the items are, are programmed and how they're supposed to work in the world. But, you know, that would be decided once once those elements are actually implemented. So it's not too hard to make that kind of change, if necessary. Uh, or like the potion, is it auto-use? It could be just a passive item, like when you lose all your health, then the, then the potion just refills half of it or something like that. Um, and that way, it, I actually really like items that are sort of hands-off like that. Like, um... A lot of times when I think about item systems in shops, I think about the the Goemon games. So Goemon's Great Adventure, and um, yeah, the first N64 one as well also I think did it this way. If you have, so you buy an armor item, and what it does is just adds like more health points to your meter. And those go away first, but you can't replenish them. You know, with an item, but the health items you didn't use them on the fly. They would they would take effect once you lost all your life, and then it would just refill it back like three or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you'd like that song. Kirby's Adventures got good stuff in it. Good stuff. That's one of my favorite NES boss battle musics. Is, is this one? Absolutely. Just just the way that it. I don't know, it's so different than a lot of the other ones. There's a lot of, a lot of tension, a lot of, uh... Like, he's Nightmare, and you feel that through the music. Like, it's... It's cool. He looks cool, too. So, uh... Yeah, so, I don't know. Items could be passive like that. So, say you can buy only one at a time, and that refills half your life when you, when you, you know, died or whatever. Oh, yeah, dude, if Gametto does that, holy crap, I'll be all over that one. Like, that, did he, did he do it? I don't think he did, right? If he hasn't, he really should, like that, because he's done so many other Kirby ones. And, oh god, like, he, he killed it on the, the Planet Robobot or whatever. That final battle thing? Holy crap. Oh, he did. He did. Oh, okay. Cool, I'll have to look that up then. I don't know if I've heard that one from him. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll definitely check that out after the stream. Oh, that's gonna be so good. <laughs> it's gonna be so good. Um, but yeah, so like items, like I said, this could just be a passive thing. You can only buy one at a time, and then when you go back to the mouse, if you've used it, then he's got another one in stock. You could do something like that. I think keeping it as simple as possible in that regard is, is something to strive for, especially in a, in a retro kind of NES title like this. I think it's, you know, keeping things as... Not necessarily as automatic as possible, but, you know, pretend that you only have two buttons like the NES had. You have to simplify things. Why is this saw double-bladed? It's it's not. Um, this is just the lighting. And this is just to show the, the, the groove texture on the bottom. I mean, you, you could do this, but I thought this looked a little weird. Actually, I don't know. This doesn't look too bad. Yeah, you could probably get away with this. I just thought using the, the texture for it would have looked a little better. Uh, let's see. Three, three. Okay, do this. Just, I don't know, looks a little goofy that way. Uh, but this is just a shine on it. So instead of having the gaps, you have this, basically. It's no Keyblade. <laughs> or no, it's a- oh, you said no, it's a Keyblade. Yeah, Keyblade. Um, now whether or not I'll stick strictly to two buttons, I'm not sure yet. I mean, obviously you got start and select, but those are like the menu and, and that kind of stuff. Um, 
but as like, like having two action buttons, I'd like to strive for that. But I wouldn't be opposed, like I said, to, to bending the rules a little bit and adding the red. Oh, actually, screwed that pixel up. That should have been a white one. I think I, or bright one rather. Um, I think I was trying out different color brightnesses for the characters when I did that. You'll notice that these actually reuse the green kids uh, palette here. I think it's this one. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, um, if I absolutely have to add a third action button, that's fine, I guess. Um, I'm not completely opposed to it, but I'll try to stick to two. And then, and then again, like, using items automatically might be a part of that. Just to cut down on a number of buttons needed. I mean, you can do, like, what Castlevania did. And, like, you know, up and attack is a different thing, but... I don't know. It depends. We'll see how that goes. I think the most important aspects of the retro NES stuff to keep in mind here is more or less like the design simplicity and like the aesthetics you know like sending you back to that era of oh yeah this is this is what those games back then kind of felt like and adding some modernization here and there is okay but you know it's not gonna be overblown I'm not gonna make a giant 40 hour experience out of it because it's just this is not how the games really were back then not to say that it's bad to have that but it's just that's not my target for this I want I want it to be um, I want to use the word cozy I want it to be like cozy and familiar and, and, and like like the good old days right yeah something like that <laughs> Only old people say that. I guess I'm old. The good old days. Uh, but obviously there's there's some design elements that, that don't lend well to that. But, like, Shovel Knight was a good example. Shovel Knight really felt like an old NES kind of game. Uh, it didn't stick to the to the uh, the limitations of the NES by far. Like, it broke tons of rules. But it, it had enough aesthetical value to it that it's like, No, nah, yeah, this is pretty much one of the old games. It's just released today. Cozy Terror Mansion. There we go. That'll be the title. Um, oh, yeah, that, that's the other thing. I'm not... And most games don't actually get their titles until later. Um, so there's no... Um, obviously no title right now. So I guess I'll just refer to it as the Mansion Game for now. Until we've got something a bit more substantial. Um, yeah, Cozy Terror Mansion. There you go. That's the title. Cozy Terror Mansion. <laughs> but cozy isn't like, you know, the feeling you get when you play it, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, this is this is one of those old games, man. This is back in the day. This is what it was like. That kind of feeling, I think, is, is important to strive for in this project. Uh, that's not to say that it'll be necessarily a complete nostalgia bait project. I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that that's what I'm striving to do. But I'd like to have that feeling uh, of the old game captured in it. Because I think it's something that we don't we don't really see. Like, we see a lot of people try to attempt it or say that they're attempting it, but they don't really succeed in it. Uh, nostalgia Bait Mansion. Yeah, there you go. Nostalgia Mansion. There, we've got our title. Um, you don't really see a lot of games that live up to that. You know, like, oh, hey, we're using the retro aesthetic, we got pixel art or whatever, but they don't feel like the old games. Either it's a quality issue, or, you know, it's just, hey, we're going to make a completely new, crazy wild indie thing, but we're just going to happen to have pixel art with it. And it's just like, no, it's not really the same. So there, there's certain intangible aspects, I, I guess you could say, about the, the feeling of the old games and how they were represented that, that really make them what they were. And simplicity is part of that. It's a bigger part of it than I think a lot of people realize. You know, having stuff that's too complicated just doesn't doesn't jive with that era. And and that's, <laughs> that's a very subjective 
you know, feeling. Like, what's too complicated is, uh, you know, is having an item menu too complicated? I don't know. Depends on the game, I guess. You know, I expect to have an item menu in Final Fantasy, but I don't expect to have uh, an in-level item menu in Mario. They had items on the on the overworld. Sprite Ecto. <laughs> Maybe later. Um, that's the other thing. I'm not sure exactly how the game is, is going to look. These are all just placeholder things. Um, but I'll get into that in a second. But, you know, that's that's something to think about. Like, Mario had items on the overworld. Final Fantasy had to have items. It was menu-based combat. But I wouldn't expect having in Mario to have to open up the menu and grab a mushroom and being able to use that in there. It's just... That's complicated for Mario, so it kind of depends. You know, Mario is just really keep it simple. Here's the rules of the game, and here's your levels, you just go to it. I think we can reach somewhat of a, of a middle ground there. And being able to, um... You know, have an inventory. Like, Simon's Quest had an inventory, you could switch... You know, your... Your secondary weapon. I think, like, um... Yeah, you could switch between the Dracula parts, because each one of those had a power. And those were a passive ability kind of thing. Um... You didn't have to command them to do anything, and then you could switch your sub-weapon, which was an active ability. You actually had to put in a command to use it. So, we might be able to get away with some of that. But, we'll see. You know, things like the health up, maybe that can just be an automatic thing, like Goemon does. Like, Goemon's a very good example of just core, simple design, I think. Wonder Boy existed on these old systems. Look at Dragon's Trap. Yeah, Wonder Boy had a lot of, um... It was almost kind of like Zelda 2 in the way that it was. Um, let's see, Dragon's... Dragon's Trap? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna... I'm gonna Google this one off-screen just for the... The trap there. <laughs> Dragon's Trap sounds like, uh... <laughs> sounds like some dirty cosplay. <laughs> Oh, okay, so it's Wonder Boy 3, the subtitle is Dragon's Trap. Okay. Here, I'll bring it over. Dragon's Trap. You guys are trying to get me in trouble now. Yeah, okay, this is the one that they remade then. Trap. Yeah! <laughs> it's a trap. Um... Is this the original? Oh, this is this is a retro aesthetic in the new release. Was it? Wait, hold on. Was it an NES game? Or was it Genesis? Looks like it was Master System or something, based on the. Yeah, is that Master System or Genesis? <laughs> With password save. I like how that's a box feature to put right up on top. With password save, dude. Look at that box art. Look at him, look at this dude! Holy crap, look at his face! <laughs> oh, there's, there's all sorts of wrong with this! <laughs> look at his face! He just... I can't, I can't even describe it, it's just... <laughs> just look at it. <laughs> it's Master System? Okay. Which is pretty NES-y. Um, okay, yeah, here, here's this one. Wonder Boy 3... Oh, that might be the new... Maybe the new one. Okay, I think the new one's got a retro look mode, too, so maybe that's that? I don't know. Alright, yeah. Alright, that's the old one. The remake is one to one. Gotcha. Yeah, it might be might be something to, to play just to research it and see as a full inventory system. Yeah, I kinda gathered from what you were saying. It looks like a very Zelda 2 kind of game. But yeah, like I said, uh, I can play it and you know, get an idea of what they did there too. And that's part of it, you know, active research 
during the project, especially in its, in its core days like this. More complex than Monster World 4, oddly. That's funny. Huh. Interesting. Oh, is that the... I guess they're releasing it on Switch? The new one? Well, I don't think it's... I, I can check it later. I don't, I don't have to deep dive into it right now. Uh, I mean, the inventory system's gonna be a while before we get to it anyway. So, I'll keep it in mind just as we go along, but... Like I said, I want to keep focus on, on the the initial core elements first of, you know, running and jumping, platforms, that kind of stuff. That has to come first. If that doesn't feel good, then your game's just not going anywhere. If that's going to be one of your core mechanics. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the graphics, though, for a minute. Uh, I, I touched a little bit on it earlier, but I did try the flat style. I actually really wanted to do the flat sprite style at first, because, like, that's old. Like, that's old school. That's super old school on yes. A lot of the original, you know, releases on there were like that, like the Turtles game. Um, it's the kind of game that fits comfortable in your Mylon slash Castlevania inspirations. Interesting. Alright, yeah, I'll definitely check that out then. Let's see what that has to offer. But yeah, I was thinking of, like, the original Super Mario Brothers, they didn't have outlines. They just designed the character so that it would fit with the, uh... Oh, excuse me. And that it would just fit with the color element. So each each element is kind of its own color. You got the skin is that color, and that separates it from the hair, which is this color. And then... The... Like, say he's got a gray t-shirt, but the... The, um... The sleeve also can't be gray without an outline. So you have to make it green. Use a different color to contrast. And you can't use the skin color because that's already used for the arm. I mean, you could. You could say that he's got a tank top on, but he... Now he's just... Now he's just kind of a... Now he just kind of looks like a... A bully. Rough and tumble. Rough and tumble, uh... Bully. It's just a bully. <laughs> you get the idea. Um, so I designed this character based on that philosophy. Your current inventory system resembles Monster World 4 more. Really? Hmm. Yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll check it out. Like I said, there's a lot, lot of time to figure out how to handle the, the items at this point. That's why I'm starting with you know, the super core elements of it, and we'll attach that stuff on there. So I say, I can research that over time. And it's, it's better to digest that kind of stuff over time anyway. Do you think too far ahead in the future? And then, you know, you might turn around and be like, you know what, we don't need an item system. Screw it. Throw it out. I mean, in this case, I'm pretty sure we're gonna have it. But, um, I always try to start with the core elements, get those out of the way. Because you might, at some point, realize, you know, I snap. This isn't the direction that, that we should be going anymore, and then, so stuff, some stuff can just be left on the table. So thinking about a mechanic that requires, like, three other mechanics to be put in first, if one of those mechanics gets changed or thrown out, or at that point you're like, you know, it doesn't drive with, with the rest of it. So that's why I try to keep, keep things on the ground level, at least starting out, because, like, this is literally day one for prototyping. I mean, and, and of course, we've only done discussion so far, but, you know, that's also part of it. Uh, the actual programming, whether or not we actually get that to that today is another question, but, um, there's no reason to rush. When you rush, you make mistakes, you make hasty decisions that can hamper the project, and I think my flux is kicking in. <laughs> the screen just looks a little more red right now. Yeah, I didn't have it disabled. It's, if you don't know, it's a, it's a desktop axe, app, F-Lux or Flux. Um, essentially, it, it, it dims your... It turns the color on your monitor to more of a sunset color in time with the actual sunset outside. Um, and the reason is to kind of keep... Like, when you stare at the blue monitor or, like, cool colors on the monitor... 
the general glow of it, like that keeps you awake. It's something with your with your brain's just like, oh, it's not sunset yet. This is normal light, you know, like outside. But if it starts to look like a sunset on your computer monitor, then you start to get. It doesn't like make you sleepy, but it starts to trick your brain to be like, hey, it's nighttime, right? Yeah, all right. So let's start winding down, and your body goes through that process. It's to uh, to keep nerds like me who like to uh, work until 4 a.m. Uh, at the glow of my computer monitor from uh, from doing exactly that, so that they're we're not going over our time here and actually getting some sleep. <coughs> it's great. You should get it. It's free. But <laughs> that tangent aside, um, so yeah, I was saying, uh, I designed a character basically uh, based on that limitation of each element has to be its own thing. Um, I did kind of put a line here to differentiate the leg, and I could have gone all the way with it, but I didn't like the look at that. I didn't, I didn't like that. Um, Mario got around it by just simply not having anything in the middle, and that's how they did it. They're just like, eh, we gotta spread the legs out. And that's okay, that works too. But uh, eventually I did realize that this is not gonna work right, and partially because of- Yeah, delinquent! <laughs> that's delinquent behavior, 4am. <laughs> I'm still guilty sometimes. Still guilty. So when you have two characters like this, you can never use this green color in the background, because it will it will destroy his outline and make him partially invisible. And, okay, so now we've got two characters, say, we can play as. Well, we can never use blue, either. So now we've got two colors we can't use for the background. Um, and we also can't use... We also can't use this, or this in the background. And that sucks, because, like, the darker colors are really good for backgrounds. And now we're starting to run into an issue. Can't use that. And you can't use this. Alright, now we got six colors out of a very limited palette that we can't use in the background. Alright, we've got another character. So you can you can play as the the girl here. Alright, well can't use this color. And can't use this color, and that's all different colors from this one, and can't use that color. That might be a good sky color. Alright, so now we've got nine colors that we can't use in the background, ever, because those characters will become partially invisible when that happens. Alright, we got four characters now. <laughs> uh, let's see. 24? Okay, so she shares one with Deke. We'll go there. We can't use that one. That's a good background color. Uh, and this... That's 53. Yeah, that's different. And you can't use that one. So, now we've got, what, 9, 10, 11 colors that we cannot use in the background. And that destroys a lot of our ability to make compelling background graphics. So that doesn't work. <clears throat> and I think a lot of... I think that's the reason a lot of... Um, a lot of developers with NES graphics ended up going with an outline style. Like, famously, Capcom really, like, pushed that. They're like, oh yeah, our graphics are, like, super good on Mega Man because we've got the outline. Um, and that comes with its own limitations, too, but it, it allows you to put um, characters on backgrounds, you know, that... Uh, and we'll use, we'll use her as an example. Well, as you put characters on backgrounds without worrying about the color leading through. So see here, look how that looks. <laughs> She's like almost invisible in the background. She merges into it. Like this is this is what I'm saying. You can't use these colors if you got a flat design. So you have to you have to be very 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 careful. So the ways they got around it were basically well. The background's just black, and we just don't use black on anything. And so there you go. So that actually stands out a little bit. You can still see her through the black. And that contrasts well with almost any of the colors, because it's just pure black. Uh, and we can see this just by putting all the kids here. That's okay. That works out alright. But that's boring. You don't want just black backgrounds. 
And so another compensation they had to do is they had to say, okay, well, we can only have one character. Or rather, only, um, <laughs> you're speaking to MC Kids, right? Here you go. Came up on the playlist. He's like, okay, we've got two characters, but we can't have them have different palettes because we have to restrict the palette that we have. Um, actually, Teak's definitely not made for this lighter palette, but... Alright, we'll just, uh... I don't know. I guess he's green now, whatever. So it's like, okay, you got a green kid. So they have to have the same palette because you're not... You can't use that in the background. Um, so you have to you have to save on the colors that you're not using so these characters are the same so this like the Ninja Turtle game worked out really well they could just make all the Ninja Turtles the same palette essentially they're all green um, and so now they know okay we can all, we can't use these three colors in the background but that's fine you know uh, and we'll do that with the enemies so we'll give like two or three palettes for the enemies and and or two pallets for the enemies and one pallet for items, and maybe they'll share pallets between enemies and items. You know, Mega Man does that. The uh, the bullet pallet is the same as Mega Man's face pallet, and it's also the same as the item pallet. So like the dropped health bar or the dropped health items are the same as the uh, colors as the bullets and that kind of stuff. And then Mega Man's charge shot is the same color as his blue pallet for his armor. And that kind of stuff. So they reuse that. So those two, actually, those two, the the blue and the um. Oh, let me pull it up. Uh, Eggman sprites. Yeah. Uh. Well. Um, so Mega Man's got, he's got the face and the, the, the white, the skin color, and the black on his face. But he's also got the light blue, dark blue, and black on his armor. So they just, they just build the buster shot, the, the little lemon one, out of the face palette. So it's actually skin colored. And it's got white highlight on it. No, actually, uh, in those games didn't use the white highlight, but, um... But the health items used the white, so they had the white, the skin, and the black. And so they built it out of that, and that's palette one. And then palette two is whatever color his armor is. And so the enemies don't share palette, the blue palette, because that might change. Like when he charges, it actually changes. Or when he changes weapon, it will change to a different one. So that one's only his. But the enemy, like, uh, I don't know if the, if the Mets use, use the skin palette or not. I don't think so. I think they, they still have their own. So you've got the, the items use the skin palette. The or the, the weapon energy um uses the the armor color, so that changes like so if you if you change like Quick Man's weapon and or not Quick Man. But I can't remember what Quick Man's colors were. But Flash Man gave you Time Stopper, which was purple. So if you change the time stopper and you got the purple armor, your weapon pickups to refill your weapon energy would also be purple. And then if you switch back to no weapon, they would turn blue because they're, they're sharing the colors on Mega Man's armor. And so there's only four, four sets of colors you can have, four palettes for characters. Um, and then there's four palettes for the background, but that's different. Um, but then that, so that it leaves you only two. So you've got one that's always the, the weapon in the face is always there. The one that's Mega Man's armor will change with the with the special weapon that you you select, like down here. And then you've got two different ones that they they change out depending on what uh, what um, enemies are in the stage. So what colors that they're going to use, and then they select based on that. That's kind of how that works. Um, so you only have so many things. So say with the Ninja Turtles game, they got one for the green turtles. They probably got one, a common one for like weapons and stuff. Like Castlevania does that too. They've got a common weapon palette. A lot of games do that, and then that's shared across items usually. Um, and then you've got two remaining. So you've got like Simon Belmont's color. You've got his whip 
color. Um, or your item color there. Actually, yeah, Castlevania. Yeah, Surf Sub. <laughs> so you know, you know what? I threw that one under because I'm not sure that it, a lot of people would know it. So you, you figured it out though. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's uh, Silver Surfer, right? Yeah, that's Silver Surfer. Horrible, horrible game, but great soundtrack. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm just trying to, I guess, express how limited the kind of color color options are here and why they went to an outline style. So Mega Man can go on a background that has any of the colors that he has on there because his outline retains his shape. And that's why a lot of them moved to that. And I, f I fell into the same problem, you know, here. Uh, this just wasn't working, especially if you have multiple characters. It just doesn't work. You have to sacrifice so many colors. And that's not even including enemy palettes. So what are the enemies going to do? So now you can't use any of these colors. And, and you'd have to creatively try to make sure that some of those colors might be represented over here, too, on one of the characters. It's just, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it to go through all that hassle. You're going to sacrifice background quality and all that stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I was testing here, which is why I was putting them there. Now, if you use a colored outline, you can sort of get away with some stuff, but this, this makes them a little invisible there. It helps separate them from this background. But here it still kind of merges in, so I'm not 100% sure how I want to handle this. Um, I do like colored outlines. Like, Mario 2's got a lot of those. That's how they, they did stuff with theirs. Uh, I guess we'll look at this one. MarioUniverse.com. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Alright. Uh, hey, speaking of Mario... Okay, so yeah, like this. Like, Mario's got, um... He's got blue as his outline. And that's kind of what I was thinking here. Use the blue as the outline. Or, not that one. Sorry, this one. Use the blue as the outline. And just try to avoid using that blue, or... You know, even if it's there, it might not be as egregious. Why are there two Marios? Oh, I guess they're different rips. Where's Luigi? Oh, duh. It's right here. Yeah, Luigi, same thing. He uses blue as his outline. I expect that. But, you know, he can use whatever colors on the inside. It don't matter. Um, and then... Peach? So she uses, like, a brown outline color. They use it for her hair and stuff. Usually the outline color is the hair. You know, it doesn't have to be, but it usually is. You know, that that kind of idea. And then Toad, where's Toad? Yeah, he's got blue outline too. So Princess is the only one that doesn't have the blue outline. Uh, but that's the idea here, so we'll use um, the outline color here. And then... I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it, it's just what it is. <laughs> so these are the outline versions that I made based on the original ones here. Um, so these are the first ones I did. Tried different palettes and stuff. So uh, this character... Um, just, I don't know. I mean, it could, it could stay. I don't mind if it stays. Um, this is actually a reference to one of our unused playable characters in the Hamster Drop game. Um, so the team that I had... Uh, with Skyland Studio, when we made Hamster Drop, we originally designed four playable characters. So we had Alex and Ray, which are the ones that actually made it in. We had Lena, who almost made it in. And then this is Deke, or this is a design, like a, like a kid design for Deke. Um, but it's based off of that character that we didn't get to add in Hamster Drop. Uh, so that's, if anybody, uh, Anybody from the squad chimes in on, in chat talking about Deke, that's who we're talking about. <laughs> um, so these characters, the other characters don't have any names, I just made just different ones, just some prototype stuff. More or less it was practice to kind of like 
think about the flat shading and how could you design characters to, uh, you know, possibly look a little different. So say you have two different types of female characters. So one, you know, has a frill and the other one doesn't. And they have different, you know, color choices to help out their specific designs and stuff. Uh, but like I said, all the, these are all placeholder. They could all go, depending on, on what we want to design. So, um, I have been talking to a guy about concept art. So if he uh, indeed redesigns the characters, we might just go with those. But they were just kind of a placeholder thing. Just something to, to get the idea across. This is kind of what I'm thinking of. I don't mind this design, though. I kind of like the hair. The look of the hair. And that kind of stuff. Um, oh, yeah, I should talk about the little mini ones. Um, we're not going to use these. Uh, the idea was sprung from Mylon Secret Castle, so actually let me pull up. So Mylon's Secret Castle has um, <laughs> the AVGN episode, <laughs> of course. Oh, let's uh, go back to normal zoom. Skip. So Mylon's Secret Castle, when it starts, you'll notice that they they use the small sprites on the outside, um, and this is something that I, I tested to see if that was something that might be interesting. So see how he's all small here. And you go into the doors, and the doors are small. I think you can see the whole thing. I was thinking maybe you could see the mansion like that, but it didn't work out. Um, and now he's got big sprites because he's inside. You know, something like that. Um, oh boy, bonus stage. Hey, this guy's this guy's tazzing it or something. It's like super play. He knows where to go. He's got the Nintendo power. He knows all the secrets. It's the only way you can play this game. <laughs> Um, but you get the idea, like, that, that it was that the, the outside map was going to use the small characters, but it didn't really work in practice. I, I did a little, little quick mock-up of, like, what that might look like, and, like, you would have to see the second floor. Like, it works for the outside of a castle, like it does in my line, but it doesn't really work here. I don't think it, it, it's good. Um, I wouldn't have minded it if it did work. But I don't think it, it works in this context. It just doesn't. It doesn't fit the kind of like mansion aesthetic. So that's when I redesigned it, and I'm just saying, okay, whatever floor you're on, it's it basically works like a normal level. You've got the normal size sprite. You see here, I'm not using the outlined one, um, and everything's a little bigger, and that's fine. It, it makes a little more cohesive experience. Um, between, you know, you don't have as much of a... How do I want to put it? You don't have a much of a different feeling that you're in a different mode of the game when you're in the hallway as opposed to when you're in the level. Um, oh, also to be clear, uh, you might be wondering, well, can do enemies pop up in the hallways? Can you be attacked in the hallways? And, and probably not. It's kind of like your little safe space. So this is more of a, you know, you're thinking about where to go. You're not going to have to, you know, dodge ghosts and crap here. So it's kind of like, the horror only begins when you enter a room. And I think I also like that that uh, feeling of, like, it's almost like a feeling of dread. It's like, you know behind the door there's something. There's something there. And you're safe in the hallway. You're, you're good here, but you're stepping out of your safe zone. And you're going into the danger every time that you open a door. I think I think I like that little subtle emotional feeling out of it. So the more I thought about it, the more I thought that you know the the hallway should be devoid of enemies for those reasons. So you kind of like ramp up the tension when you're going into the into the level. I mean, until you get intimate with the levels and you know you know what to expect. But you know, next first time you enter a door, you don't know what's going to be behind it. So it's going to be all new. I think that I think that'd be an interesting feeling to have. Um, so that just to explain all of that. 
<clears throat> but uh, yeah, so that that was that was the reason I had the little mini sprites, but it, it didn't work out. I think so. I'm just gonna use the big sprites for something. Unless I don't know, maybe an enemy can shrink you, or you can get a power to shrink. There you go. <laughs> then you can use them. <laughs> the other the other reason I didn't um, also thought about not sticking with them is that some of the designs were incredibly hard to um, to work here as small versions. So like you can see here where I kind of struggled with the leg and the pants and dividing up that stuff, especially with like you know when Deke had the. I don't know, I guess, kind of reminds me, like, because there's the white line here, it's only really here to separate the legs, but it, might, it kind of makes me think of, like, sports shorts. You get the blue with the white line on it. You could think of it like that, but... Um, but that was hard to represent here. And, like, you know, this pixel beat not being there looks weird, so something had to go there, and then I had to figure out to do that. And those ones I figured out ways to do it, but man, when you get into, like these designs, like, you have to get to get rid of the trim here. Like, it becomes substantially more difficult to retain the look of the design once you get into the small, small bit there. So, that was another reason that I decided to put, put aside that idea. I didn't think it was going to work to begin with. Or, right, once I drew out the graphics, I'm like, I don't think this is going to work, but I even before I tried that, I was having a difficult time getting these designs to to work right. And then if you add the outline on top of it, forget it. Like it just it just turns into a mess. Oh yeah. Yeah, the other thing I should say is that uh, I did I did draw them based on the grid. So if you do put an outline here like that, mm, that gets a little it's a little weird. Cuz then now you're you're kind of breaking you know, out into other parts. So, like, what do you do? Do you, do you double up the feet? Like, how's that supposed to work? You know what I mean? Like, it, get, it starts to get a little weird. And you, I mean, I guess you could just say, hey, we're just not going to have the double feet, but then it looks weird. It looks like he doesn't have feet now because of the outline thickness. And now he's too tall, you know, to be represented in strictly in the grid. Well, like I said, I'm not... I'm not going to harp on that too much. If he's got to have some extra pixels outside the grid, whatever. I think it's a good idea to try to design things with this in mind, because this will definitely give you a more retro feel. Because that's the limitations they had to work with. Um, but at the same time, yeah, like right here, I tried to make sure that almost no block was wasted. So that this is a free block. You know, this was a free block. This one, this one didn't work out too well, because it's only one pixel in that one, but... I tried to make sure that he fit, you know, in the grid here. And I think, let's see... I based it on... Yeah, I based it on a double 16. So two 16 by 16s, that was my limit. And then from there I tried to optimize it. So when I do these things, I usually do them in either 8x8 or 4x4s, just to kind of optimize the design for it. So, there's that. And that's, I don't know, I guess that kind of sums up the, my thoughts on the graphical design. I, th I think there's no there's no way around doing the outlines, whether they're strict black outlines or, um, you know, if they're just these. And I'll, I'll do a black outline version just to show it. Um, now this also presents a problem. You gotta use more colors and I'll show you. So you've got the outline color in your palette. You're gonna have the green, I guess, right? And the gray. And that's one palette. You can only have three colors. And then, you know, the transparent background color. So then you need another palette for the face. 
So, you know, how's that supposed to work? You know what I mean? Uh, so here's a challenge. How do we represent that shape? Do it like that? Might be okay. I like colored outlines because they give the characters a little more color identity. And you don't have to use as, as much on the palette. But at the same time... Like that doesn't really work. That has to be redesigned. So you have to make the shoulder bigger, problem To get that to work. It gives a little more color identity because then, you know, you can say, well... His theme color is green, I guess, and you can represent that if he's outlined in green a little bit better than, than otherwise. Um, oh, I can actually have, yeah, I can actually have the legs split here with the black outline. Yeah, Kirby's Adventure. It's too good, man. I guess his eye can be black now. Oh, we could add white. We got a second pout to work with. Let me do that. He's a little more defined. Of course, the, the design can can be amped up now a little more. You could do more with it. Like you could uh, you can use these other colors in different ways now. If this was the outline color, this wouldn't work so well. Because you would end up with a really muddy looking design, you're like, what, what is that? Is that stripes, or is that supposed to be something else? You know, it might be a little confusing. That actually doesn't look terrible, but, you know, once you start getting, like, the arm moving and stuff, how does, how is that gonna look? It gets a little muddy here, you know what I mean? It's a little weird. So that's something to, something to think about, you know, with this kind of stuff. You know, how do you represent it? Is, is it gonna be like that? Now that looks a little weird. That's not the worst, but... I mean, you can see where it can get a little muddy, and that can work in your favor, too. Because outlines don't have to be quite as defined, like here, where the hand meets. It doesn't have to be quite as defined. It's, it's all the same color, so screw it. Just make sure your hand is shaped good, and that the hand has a good read on it. And then you can you can just kind of fudge this detail because well he's got black pants or, or green pants or whatever it's the same as the outline color. Um, I don't know, I'm looking at his stripe it isn't actually that terrible. Um, doesn't come out too bad. It does make the shoulder a little harder to see though. And see that's the concern with, with getting muddy with it. But, I don't know, that's, that's the aesthetical decisions that you have to make with these kind of things. Man, that doesn't look great. I guess. Yeah, so then you, I don't know, you sometimes run into trouble with it. I guess that looks okay-ish. I can save that. Oh, actually, wait, hold on. <laughs> I, I, I edited it over those. Let me put them in their own realm here for a second. We're gonna undo that. I wanna keep the, the old designs here. Uh, that one's a copy, so that one can go. And there, there's our striped shirt version or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's easier to get the stripe now here, and I can actually use a lighter color for him because it's not his outline, doesn't have to be as dark anymore. So there, that helps define, you know, his thing, or you know what, because that's lighter, I can use the white t-shirt again. So something like that. And you know, it gives you, it gives you a better range of use of, of elements for the most part. You just gotta make sure your outline looks good. And that's the hard part. Like, these don't always translate too well between each other. The shoulder looks okay-ish, but it could be better. You know, the, the arm's a little... Could probably use more refinement here. Like, 
Like this corner here just doesn't look very good. So you have to think about that. Um, you can also, you can actually, you can probably get away with selective outlining here. Um, even though the clothing and you know ends here, and then you start with the skin, um, they're different enough colors that you can read those as though they're different. So you don't really need an outline between them. The same thing like here, uh, the white shirt and the stripes they read as separate. You know, you don't need an outline around the stripes to get the idea that you know they're supposed to be separate. So you can do that. You could do that with the hair, but I don't know if I would or not. The hair is a, a pretty popped out element, so I don't know. You could get away with a little bit of selective outlining here, maybe. Like this, so... Uh, I don't know. Maybe something like that. Maybe you don't want so much of a hard outline on on the hair and the, and the ear here. If you think about it this way, um... You know, this part of the ear is kind of connected to your head and should be right next to the hair. But this part of the ear is suspended outward and over over the uh, the hair, so you get that effect, perhaps. I don't like this intersection here, but I can't think of anything better to do with it. But yeah, I mean, you can do that. You can selectively outline that part and bring it back around. You can do a lot with, with outlines. You can do a lot with a lot of the styles. It just you have to decide on on what to do with them because you have to substantially edit them. You know when I don't know if that looks good or not. Probably not. Oh, actually, I think those are supposed to be green. I don't know. You gotta you gotta decide what style you want to go with. And I think we're heavily leaning, at least in having an outline period, whether it be a black outline or a colored outline, I'm not sure. And you typically only want to do that on the... Um, but see how much better that pops out <laughs> when you have something like that, with an actual solid black outline. But whether or not we go with that, I'm not sure. I do like the idea of colored outlines, but they still, again, pose a little bit of problem with situations like this, so... You know. Deke's got a lot of blue on him, so if we use blue in the background, like, how is that gonna work? You know? So, just to test it, you can say... Alright, we're gonna make that blue. I don't know. Kinda makes Deke a little invisible in some spots. So, it, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Figuring that out is one of the hardest places to start with. But that's why I say all the, these things are placeholders here. Like, most of his head just kind of disappears into the background. But does he have enough defining features that in motion that you can tell where he is? Even if he's blending in the background? I don't know. That's a tough call, too. You could try to give Deke the same outline treatment. But will he look the same? I don't know. I kind of like the... I don't know, the, the blue kind of goes with this theme, too. So I hate to... I hate to do it, you know, to add that. I don't know. Yeah, that don't work. Right. I don't know. You get the idea. It's it's just a lot of working and reworking. Try to figure out what you can do with it. Like in this case, I think actually hard outlining the white element here works in its favor. Um, and now this doesn't look quite right, so I don't know. Yeah, that actually that actually looks pretty good. That way. Could do that. You could definitely do that. I think that would work. Uh. That don't look too good now. That don't look right. 
And I probably just have to do that. That works out okay. And then leave his, his hair blue, I guess. Alright, and so now let's compare that. And... Hey, I think it pops out pretty good there. Well, let's also do what we did before. And boom. Now Deke really pops out, like he's got no problem. Look at, he's got no problem at all. Here he's, he's blending in, but here, there's nothing. You can use the same color, and it don't matter. You see that outline. Uh, would be good to go with a red-green color scheme in the backgrounds. Horror films use that palette a lot. Oh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, actually it's really funny because the, um... The, uh... Hold on, let me back it up. Um, this was... This was actually red at one point. But I did change it only because it was, um... I'm just gonna... Kinda... Wing it here. Was it that that I had red? Something else I had red. Or you could say that, you know, this could be green, too. Like a different, I don't know, cyan -y. Kind of green. But, I don't know, I settled on the blue because of the, the orange in the background. But, um, hmm. Red? Red slash green color thing. You mean, like, actually using, like, literally red and green together? Or just like some rooms are more have a lot of red in them and some have a lot of green or something like that. I mean, just to kind of like play with it here, but oh god, that looks terrible. That needs to be dark. So you know what I can do? Uh, let's make the little runners here. Let's make those more white. Uh, that's kind of shitty too, but... Yeah, you get the idea. Red and green together, it's color three. Greens make reds pop. Okay, that's what I thought you meant, but I just wasn't sure. So something like that, I guess. I mean, ignore how shitty this looks, but the runners are a little too light. But is this kind of like what you mean? Uh, runner, the runner could actually be turned into blue. Perhaps. Just a, oh, but it's a little intense. Uh, and I'm obviously not using any S colors here, but... Um, Eh, oh jeez, no, that's not working out. I don't know. Whatever, you get the idea. Yeah, with darker runners? Okay, yeah, so like using the blue here. Obviously, like, yeah, and these aren't NES colors, I'm just kind of winging it, but just to kind of get an idea. Oh, this one horror palette. <laughs> so I'll know. I'll know why I saved this one this way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely looks spooky for whatever reason. It's just like I don't know. Maybe it's the red, blood red, something like that. But yeah, that's a good point. I'll keep that in mind. But yeah, I, I think the outline really, really helps Deke. Uh, it doesn't doesn't help the green kid as much, but it definitely helps Deke out, and it gives you the opportunity to, to add a little more detail. So again, I was kind of running into that direction. I had only prototyped up until that point the uh, the colored outlines, which I still really like colored outlines. But again, they they do run into those limitations. And I think that's where like, the Mega Man team's like, no, if we outline it, we can put them on anything. Like, it doesn't matter. He'll just, he'll just sit there and pop right out. Ooh, that's really intense.
that's kind of bugging me a little bit. But the gray is really dark, too. And that's the thing with the NES palette. You don't have much wiggle room here. Some of the out entries are the same. Yeah, these ones are the same. They just got the black. White, white. Uh, I don't know. You don't want to, like, try to go too far into the orange spectrum on this design, though, because, you know, it's really pretty much like skin color. So, I don't know. I'd have to play around with it to find a better one. I'll be honest, the, the reason I chose these colors is because I really like the colors from Luigi and Mario 1. So, um... Mario Bros. 1 Luigi Sprites. <laughs> Mario Universe again. Luigi! Yeah, there you go. Well, that's kind of crappy because you can't really see him on the background. Uh, what's his real point? Yeah, here we go. I see how he's got the, he's got the green and white. I always love that color combination. I don't know why. So that's, uh... That's why I ended up doing doing that color initially. Oh, the other thing I was gonna, since we're talking about palettes, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the palette that I chose to use is the NES palette. But a lot of people, I wouldn't say that they. It's not. It's not knowing or not knowing. It's not. It's not a case of knowing or not knowing. It's. It's, it almost comes down to preference. So here's the thing, and, and I'm gonna get into the, gonna get into the talking about emulators a little bit, which is always a, a legally hairy thing. But just to exemplify what I mean here, uh, on, on an actual NES, on an actual TV, uh, the colors look a certain way. But then when, and, and part of that's due to, you know, how good is the TV, how is it tuned and stuff. But the actual output colors, the signal coming out of the NES, has um, has a certain look to it. And that's the palette that I'm using here. It's commonly referred to as the NTSC palette. Uh, and it's a little darker. It's a little higher contrast. And I'm using that because I think that will fit like a, a like a playful horror game, I guess. It's not like it's not like Resident Evil horror game, obviously. You know, you can still run and jump and do do crazy goofy stuff. So I would call it playful horror, I guess. Like Castlevania is it's not terrifying horror. It's you know it's still a video game, it just has a horror aesthetic to it. Um I think that palette works good with that. And it's also like, you know, when emulators came out and you played it on an emulator, everything looked a little off. And it's hard to describe why. You look at it and you're like, I don't know, something's not quite right about it. But hey, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Um, but when when I saw when, when Nintendo brought out the, the WiiWare titles, <clears throat> and I played that, and I'm like, oh, that's it. That's what it was. It was the colors. And Nintendo knew what their hardware looked like when it outputted the colors. Um, but I don't know, the, the emulators, either they guessed at the colors, or maybe the... In, I, it sounded like, when I looked it up, that the internal data of the NES suggested what the colors might actually look like, but that's not what they really looked like when it went out through the, through the processing of the, uh, of the hardware. I think that's right. I might be wrong on that, but I think that's what I've read. Is that so? The internal color palette uh, kind of gives off the idea that no, the colors are actually supposed to be this, but it's just that they end up a certain way when it runs through the hardware and and to your TV. Um, but you know, the end result is the end result. You know, you didn't see what the data saw. You saw what came out through your TV. So. When they came out with the WiiWare titles with the NES, the Virtual Console, like I immediately knew what was wrong the whole time, and I just knew because you could—they knew the hardware, so they—they they did. Um, they made it look like it should. So let's see. I don't know if I can actually pull up 
a thing here. So, Super Mario Bros. 1 emulator. Um, wow. Where is... Okay, this would probably be a good screenshot to use. Um, I don't want to open... We'll just save the picture. I don't want to open... Um, I don't want to open the site itself, I just want to save it. Uh, really? I didn't end the project. Well, I'll just go back here and the game. And I'll just pop it in here. Okay, so then Super Mario Bros. 1 Virtual Console Wii. I don't know. It's got the guy's face in it, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay, so here's, here's the, and it hit me when I saw it, because I played the original on a, on a TV, on the original hardware, and I'm like, something's not right, but I don't know what. Um, but here's the difference. It's the palette. When people played it on emulator, or saw footage on emulator, this is what they would see. But that's not really what it looked like back then. Look at how the palette's much darker, much more contrasted in some spots. You know, like, the bush to the ground here, here, they're, they're very similar. They're not at the same value, but they're similar value. Much closer than here. And that's what it was. So, my current feeling is to, let's use what it actually looked like. Let's use the old, the old colors, man. You know, if someone picks up the game, and they see it, and they're like, oh, that's, you know, that looks just like, like the old, the old days. It's not gonna look like this. It's gonna look like, gonna look more like this. And some people like the new style, or the new color, the guest colors, or whatever, the data colors, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, but I don't think anything beats the look of the original if you played the original stuff. So I really want to use that. And again, I think the darker palette works better because of the horror aesthetic as well. Um, now I can show you what it would look like um, on the, uh, let me close that one, how it's all mucked up on that. Uh, yeah, that's fine, you can save that. I can show you, I can absolutely show you what it would look like with the with the brighter emulator type palette, because I've, I've created that one too. Um, I call it the NES Approximate. Where is it? Yeah, here. So I'll maintain the indexes so it it overlays them what they should be. But now doors look red. Uh, the mouse <laughs> mouse don't look terrible, but he's he's definitely a lot brighter. Uh, a lot of colors are just very different. Deke looks orangey now. You know, like this hair doesn't come out as good. Because it's much brighter, it's very reddish. Uh, the outline one's not too bad, but it's because the outline helps separate it. But it's very bright, very bright color for the hair. So I would say, hey, we're gonna use the darker one in this case. We're using that palette. That works better. Uh, I don't know if I would go with this or not. That's not bad. So you, again, you know, you have to decide what are you gonna use because. I built these with the other palette, but now they look really weird with this palette. Like, again, <laughs> Deke looks orange. Like, what happened? You know? So if we go back, there you go, now Deke has a more appropriate skin color. Uh, so that's, that's my thoughts on, on that, and I can show you this one too. So of course this is using the, I guess we want to call it the NTSC palette. We can, we can load the the emulator palette, but man, look, everything changes. It's, it's all kind of, it's a little too intense. It's not not as moody, not as, not as dark. You don't have the contrast on a lot of stuff. So, I guess that's my, that's my old man rant about the, the NES palettes. But I, I think going with the dark one's the right choice here. 
not just for the fact that, you know, when, when an old-timer like me picks it up, they'll be like, hey, it looks just like the old games! Or maybe they won't even notice, they might, they might just, something might click and they're like, this is familiar and I don't know why. Because I think a lot of people have that, kind of like, you know, I, I played it on the NES, but then I played it on other hardware and it just, there's something weird, just, something's just not right about it. Something's just off, and I can't tell why. It's just something's off. And that's the feeling that I had. It's absolutely the feeling I had. I'm like, I don't, I can't explain it. I don't know why there's something wrong here. I just know that there's something wrong. And it just ended up being that. Flat out. It ended up being the colors. And so I like, I like the old palette. I think it looks good. I think for this game specifically, it will work better than having this one. Um, and I want to invoke that that sense of yeah, yeah. That's 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 what the OG NES looked like. That's just it, man. Maybe I'm just being an old, too much of an old timer. I'm being a I don't know. You, you call you call old people boomers now. <laughs> uh, I'm being too much of a boomer. Old man boomer Mark, getting all upset about the colors. I don't look like it used to. Back in my day, we had this one. <laughs> and not this crappy one. Look how bright it is. I don't like it. It's new and different. I don't like it. I don't know. I just... I got a soft spot for it, and I think that... Just flat out that this palette worked better because of the... The horror aesthetic to it. So... There's my... My whole rant. And it kind of just brings us back around to... Boomer Mark rants about NES Pals for 15 minutes while s sipping Monster? Monster Energy Drink? Is that what you're talking about? Man, I wouldn't eat those. I swear to God, those things will probably kill you. I will not touch Monster Energy Drink. I am I'm convinced that you will die if you drink enough of that stuff. I'm sipping coffee, by the way, if you're wondering. That and water. Um, I don't know. I don't see people usually do this, but um, I always drink coffee and water back and forth. So I'll take a sip of coffee and then I'll take a sip of water. Because the coffee dries you out. Especially when I'm talking like this. Your mouth gets dry anyway. Um, and then, you know, so I use the water to compensate for the moisture loss, I guess. How can you be a boomer if you don't drink Monster? Well, boomer is boomer is supposed to mean baby boomer, right? So that's like my dad. <laughs> he don't drink Monster. Who, whose parents at our age drink Monster Energy Drink? Unless unless it's referencing something else, but I, I figured it just meant baby boomer. Cause it's like you know the old people in their like sixties now. Back in my day. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm like halfway there. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> so, <laughs> boomer mark. I feel like it sometimes, I really do. All damn world's going to hell. I'll tell you, back in my day, we didn't have these problems. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess that kind of wraps up the whole graphical... More of a question, really. Not, not even just a, a direction. I'm not even sure what direction it should be going in yet. Like, as much as I like the outline, the colored outlines, I... The more I think about it, the more that it, it probably is holding some stuff back. You're, you're sort of going to run into the same problem. If you've got multiple characters with multiple outline colors, then you're going to be restrictive on, on what you can use in the background here. You know? So, like, Deke stands out really good in this background, but, you know, the other kid, the green kid, not quite as much. And it might be enough to get by if he's moving. You can kind of see, you know, like, with his face and stuff, but... What if the whole background is that color? Like... I mean, this would probably be bad design in general, but you still have to think about the fringe case anyway. Like, but what if it's like that? You know, is there enough definition 
in the character to get you around that kind of environment. And and I I question that. I think there's there's an argument argument to be made that maybe not. Like what does he look like over here? Like that's pretty it's pretty crappy. Hey hey, Dr. Mario. Why do why did they say boomers drink monster? I don't get it. My dad don't drink monster energy drink. <laughs> I don't know anybody his age that drinks Monster. They're all like, that's just gross and probably gonna kill you. I mean, I said the same thing, but... <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, who, who drinks that stuff? They drink coffee. Again, I drink coffee, so I guess I'm half boomer, I don't know. Well, hipsters drink a lot of coffee. Just really fancy coffee. So, I don't know. He doesn't know. I don't know! No, I don't know! I'll go- I'm gonna go go it after. <laughs> why do- why do boomers drink Monster? <laughs> I have no idea. I know the- the gamers drink the Mountain Dew. Oh, they drink Monster too, so the gamers drink the Monster and the Mountain Dew. But, I don't know. Ah, whatever. It is what it is. Anyway. Uh, that's- that's a dilemma here. About the colored outlines. Now Mario 2 uses colored outlines, like we said before, and I think that they. Let's see, no, I don't have a YouTube open. I think that they they use generally um, backgrounds that don't have any detail. So Super Mario Bros. 2. Mm -hmm. Playthrough. Wait, wait, So you'll notice though. There's no background in the sky. Uh, the green and the and the blue won't merge on the background when they're standing in front. Now he's got a thing, so uh, it's whatever. This is completely back black background, so they're always gonna pop out on that, as you can see. But like here. You know, that's a good outline color for the green. But I bet they don't use that blue anywhere on a background. So they can't use that blue, and they can't use Peach's red or brown or whatever it ends up being. So they use black for the- they use a black outline on- and background elements I'm seeing. But that helps because, you know, whatever's on, you know, if there's no, if you got a colored outline, that's going to pop out from the black because the black's black. It just is what it is. So you need, oh yeah, he used the trick I used too. You can, you have one frame when you leave the vine to jump, and you can actually jump off it. It's pretty hard, but it saves you a lot of time. It's fun to do. But Birdo's got a black outline. I guess a lot of the enemies do too, don't they? Well, it's back it up here for a second. Yeah, Shy Guy's got black. Um, and so do these guys, I forget their names are. But you notice there's, there's like no detail in the background at all. And I think that, again, it's because they, they're limited on what they can use in the background. Otherwise it'll start clashing. Let's see, can we get a peach? She's got the lightest outline color. Uh, that's All Stars version. NES Peach Plays. Like hers, she's got a lighter outline, so hers is actually a better one to look at here. But again, it, it'll it'll pop out on green. She can't go inside the red tiles, so she's safe there. She'll never be overlaying that. Of course, the, the cave is black, so there's nothing there. The ladder is different enough, that's not going to cause any problems. Well, he's using the trick. The secret. So you see, you can start to see when you, when you really think about it. Um, you can really see the decisions that they had to make. 
I, I, I really believe that part of the reason that the backgrounds are so plain for the things that you don't stand on, like the sky and stuff, where the, the caves are just solid black, is, is precisely because of their chosen outline color. Where Mega Man can do whatever the hell it wants because they don't matter. They're all outlined in black. They all have that ultimate contrast to them. So here, uh, oh, what happened? Oh, ads. Three, two, one, get out of here. So look, look all the detail that they have in the background. That's because Mega Man stands out from it. It doesn't matter that there's black in the background. Because he's outlined. So they got black outline in the background to detail the rocks, but he's completely safe. It, it just separates him from the rest of it. So they can get away with as much detail as they want. So that might, that might be the way to go. Bees! <laughs> Man stage. Always a pain. The damn bees. Uh, this one they chose to have a flat background. Um, but hell, look at look at freaking Shadow Man stage. It uses a similar blue in the background, but again, don't matter. They can reuse that color. It might be the same. It might be a little darker, but it could be the same color. It doesn't matter because he's outlined in black. It's going to be absolutely separated. so they can get away with a lot more detail. I, the graphics in Mega Man 3 are actually really, really good. Just the detail that they can pull off with it. And again, part of it is because it has a black outline. But it does limit your colors, you know, per character though, so you do have to be careful. You essentially only get two colors a character. Because the outline, adds, it, you know, that's the color. You have to have the outline color in there. And if your palettes are <laughs> top spin, that's so bad. Um, if you, if one of your colors is always black because you have the outline, then you only have two colors to work with. That's why Mega Man needs a separate sprite for the face. They just couldn't pull it off. It just is what it is. fun to look back on it, though. That's yeah, a pretty plain background, but some of them get really elaborate. Gemini Man. It's got like the... Oh no! What are you doing? Why would you do that? You're ruining a perfect good bag of chips. Well, you better eat all of that right now. You better not let that go to waste. Oh, BS. Yeah, you got cool stuff like that in the background. I mean, otherwise it's black, but... As you go through the, um... And this has got pretty good texture on it. As you go through the games, like, they get more elaborate, though. Like, you look at Mega Man 6, holy crap. Like, like they really went all out on that. Um, yeah, look at that background detail. It's crazy. They're not letting anything go to waste there. And it's all because they chose to have a black outline. Like that, you can get away with that in a lot of games. They're using bright colors. They would have they would have been used by the characters. You can't do that. Let's see. What's this one? Oh, this is um crap. What character was this? What boss? I can't remember now. Who was in Mega Man Six? I don't play Six very often. Not Drill Man, Drill Man's 4. What is it? What stage is this? I don't know, I'm curious. Who is it? Who are you? Oh, whoops. Oh, too far. What's he doing? Oh, did he use like an exit? Did he not have to fight the boss? What's going on? Oh, this is Tomahawk Man. Okay. 
Oh, okay. I thought that was the other screen. That's why I didn't know that part. Yeah, it's Tom Cockman. Oh, no! You better eat all those. Oh, huh. Cereal. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Oh, God, he's taking his, really taking his time with Tom Cockman here. Yeah, it's him. Okay. I don't know. I guess that kind of... There's not really much else to talk about the, the graphic style at this point until we make a decision, but I, I think... I don't know. The more I'm thinking about it and looking at it, it kind of looks like we're going with a black outline. It just... It's going to give you the maximum amount of detail that you can use, and you can already see that's kind of what I'm going for, like, with the time. I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to use this tile set, it was just something I kind of threw together, but, you know, a mansion should have that detail, you're inside, you should be able to see the walls, it shouldn't just be black, you know, you should be able to see good detail on the floor, good detail on the walls, use, you know, any color that you want, make sure it looks good, so I think we'll be heading in that direction. Upon review <laughs> of all the greats, I guess. It's tough. You know, it's a lot it's a lot to think about. There's more to it than than it really seems like at first. And just because you have that restrictive palette, you don't have many options. So I don't know. I kinda like I kinda like the way the deep looks in the back with the outline here. I guess you could give them. You, you can outline his specs now too, but I don't know. I don't think that looks right. Nah, he looks weird like that. It's not terrible, but I still, still like the normal one. You got big old Coke bottle frames. See, that's what a boomer would say. They lived back then. I knew what that was about. Oh, I guess I did not line the shoes, but... You don't you ha actually have to outline the shoes for the most part. Uh, to kind of have the shape implied already. As long as you've got some contrast. Here, you should be okay. So even if they're, uh... Even if the element is the same, like, you've got enough contrast here that you can tell that's his feet. The thick outline on the bottom also really hurts the whole kind of like, I don't know, like how he connects to the world changes. Like it really looks like he's just kind of floating or pasted on, but when you don't have it, it looks like he's actually standing on it. That's one of the things I've noticed a lot of games would do. They would just, uh, they would choose, I say, they should choose, they would choose not to outline the bottom of the shoe to kind of just give it that effect. Or that the... I guess they like also like say, just for the heck of it, if you had a thick outline style, um, you would, um, you would want to... Oh wait, hold on, that's not what I wanted to show. Uh, let's say that we did... Hold on, let me put them on. Uh, that's not work. I need to add that line on this shoe there. Uh, that should probably be easier to do it here. So say we did add the line on the shoe. Like, if you do a thicker outline style... Like, you wouldn't normally do this on NES because you probably don't have the... <laughs> you probably don't have the memory to do it. You're not going to sacrifice the detail just to get... You would do something like this. But again, your your bottom here is always less than the rest of it. So just as a quick example. And then there. Now it still looks... You still have that sort of connection to the ground because it's thinner here. It's almost like this is the foot. It's not just this. Because of the thick outline. Looks kind of cool, but it's definitely, definitely don't look any us. Certainly pops them out, though. Uh, you get the idea. So I've noticed a lot of games do that. Mega Man doesn't. Um, they, they have the full outline on the foot, but a lot of games, they, they make sure that the foot is thin.
you know, and it just, I don't know, just looks like it connects to the world better. If you have a colored outline, you, it doesn't matter, because you kind of get away with it by default, but it's just, uh, it's just it. Alright, minimize chat, there we go. Um, that's pretty much it. So, seems like a good place to stop. We've hit our, uh, we've already hit our two hours here, so. That's, that's it. Um, that, that's the basic idea that I'm going with, and then we're just gonna let it flow from there. And I'm just like a... That's our starting point. We're gonna prototype the movement, <clears throat> the collision system a little bit, um, get that stuff going. So I'll prep that, I guess, for next time. And we can start throwing some sprites in Unity and figuring some crap out. And uh, just start messing around. That's pretty much what it's all about. You just mess around, see what works, see what doesn't work. And if it works, cool. If it doesn't, you can just change it. That's how, that's how she goes. So, yeah, if there's... <clears throat> between now and next Thursday. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have Pocket Fighter EX on Mondays. I'm going to have the Mansion Game on Thursdays. And so we'll do that. We'll run those one one episode a week or whatever, I guess, for developing finger games. So I might do stuff... For, well, <laughs> I'll say absolutely I'll be doing some stuff off-stream, you know, to prep for it. So, But I will at least explain what, what happened in the meantime until next next week, so, uh, to kind of keep you all in the loop, and then you can really see it, you know, from, from point A to point B, but, um, preparations can take hours, though, for certain things, so, it's like, if I only did that on stream once a week, we would not be done for years, uh, so it's, it's a little tough to just do everything from put in on stream, and I don't think you want to also see me sit there and scratch my head for two hours on, oh man, this thing didn't work. How do we make it work? Man, this sucks. <laughs> so there's that. So there's some stuff, like I said, I'll, I'll be doing off stream to prepare. But I'll try to explain everything as we go along, what we did. And that's pretty much it. So that's how I'm going to run it. And uh, so in the meantime, uh, if you want, like, up up to the minute, up to date stuff, we do have a Discord server. So the link for that was is down below. And um, oh, excuse me. So if you want to be part of the discussion, I mean we'll be talking about it, you know, in the server anyway, and discussing and going back and forth, sharing samples and stuff. Any kind of work that we do midweek will be there. That's the place to be if you want to really be part of, of what's going on. Um, other than that, you can follow me on Twitter, and um, we got Facebook. I don't have, a, have an account. I have an account for Game Dev Scrubs, but I don't have a specific account for the game. Uh, but uh, I might think about later in development, we might have a special page for it. But for now, that's what we've got. And, and that's pretty much it. So that kind of concludes episode one. And um, so thanks for, for hanging out with me on our super reveal. The super retro reveal, uh, and we'll be back Thursday, same time, seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time PM, and uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, we have our our stream here is patron funded, and we've got uh, we've got super special, awesome, top tier patrons that we will read out the names of uh, at the end of streams and videos. So uh, we've got Zombie Killer. He's a our Tippy Top Ultra Patron. We got Jerry Berry. We've got Javier Garcia and AJ and Bryce Nagalinum. So you are our super extra supporters, and you're the generals in the Scrub Army. So if you want to, if you too want to join the Scrub Army, <laughs> you can check out our, our Patreon, and that's the link also will be below. Um, and there's some perks. We got some code samples on there. Um, got like uh, early builds so we got like weekly builds or monthly builds you can choose you know for the projects that we have on here now this one in particular we haven't started coding yet so obviously there won't be a build for it uh, but I'm gonna have to put together something to so that you guys can check it out one, once we get that and uh, that's pretty much it so thanks everybody for hanging out uh, I guess I'll see you Maybe Monday if you like Pack Fighter, and I guess I'll see you 
uh, Thursday if you like the mansion games. So scrub out, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>